Good evening, my name is Jared Stoller, and I'm pleased to welcome each of you to St. Peter's, home of Nevelson Chapel. Welcome to those of you who are here in person, and welcome also to those of you who are joining us via live stream. It's good to see so many familiar faces here. For those of you who are with us for the very first time, you are also most very welcome. When Louise Nevelson created this masterful environment, she did so with people who were, like her, well recognized in their fields. Architects, designers, engineers, religious leaders, people working in various trades, city planners, gallerists, philanthropists, a wide array of leaders who didn't find this project one of competition, but collaboration, each committed to working together to craft an urban environment called at its opening City Corp Center, a corporate church city endeavor that would shape life at this intersection for the sake of the city. In this way, Nevelson and her colleagues were not simply functioning as artists and bankers, pastors and designers, planners and art dealers, but as citizens, citizens of the city, citizens of a shared country, citizens of a common humanity. With our partners at Boston Properties, St. Peter's remains committed to creatively shaping life in the city, committed to this high ideal of being about more than ourselves. In joining us this evening and in joining the renewal of Nevelson's masterwork, each of us, all of us together, keep alive the livingness, to borrow her word, of this remarkable place. At the genesis of it all, Nevelson said, I want to break boundaries with this chapel. Tonight's salon is inspired by boundary-breaking Louise Nevelson. It is the first in a series of conversations where we bring together people who shepherded Nevelson Chapel at its early years and people who tend to its renewal today. We are thankful that these events are made possible in part by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation Theology Program. This salon series furthers the conversation begun in a scholarly volume the Luce Foundation underwrote a few years ago titled Religion and Art in the Heart of Modern Manhattan, St. Peter's Church and the Louise Nevelson Chapel. Our friends at Ashgate Publishing have now made this volume available to us in paperback and are offering a special discount code. Stop at our book table upstairs for ordering information and for specially priced volumes also of Light and Shadow, Lori Wilson's insightful biography of Nevelson. We had planned to be joined this evening by Diana McCowan, uh, Nevelson's longtime studio assistant, but Diana's sister is undergoing some medical procedures. They're very close and Diana is tending to her now. We had a series of conversations these last few days, emotional conversations, and Diana is upset that she couldn't join us, but sends her love, all her support, and her thanks to everyone for supporting this renewal. She plans to join us at a later salon. Lori Wilson, Nevelson's loyal biographer, is here. Lori was actively interviewing Louise at the time the chapel was being constructed. We are, each of us, rich, richer for Lori's research and her commitment to this renewal. Jane Greenwood is the architect overseeing the uh, renewal of the chapel. Jane is leading and faithfully assisted by Jamie Downey an incredible team from environmental consultants to lighting designers to sustainability experts. Jane, we are thankful for your leadership, for your heart for this project, and for sharing in this conversation tonight. Easley Hamner was the project architect for Citicorp Center. The tower, the atrium, the low-rise building, the groundbreaking sunken outdoor plaza that's still under construction, and St. Peter's. I think for nine years, Easley worked with Hugh Stubbins on this project, providing the masterful guiding hand that did not simply give birth to this complex, but enabled by his own leadership, the masterful collaboration of all those people working at the top of their fields to create together one of the most mature expressions of late modernism and now New York City's youngest landmark. 
Easily it is a special honor to have you with us this night, and I am personally thankful to you and to Suzanne for making the trip from Cambridge to New York for your warmth and your support. From both of you, I've come not only to understand more fully the formative formation of this place, but the deep and lasting friendships that were formed in its making. And I'm ever so grateful to be grafted into that still growing number of people who through this place become not simply colleagues and mentors, but friends. So thank you. Over the course of this evening, I'll offer a few questions, but this really is a conversation, and so I hope comments and questions will come from and among our guests too, and not only from me. But I'll ask the first one, to whichever one of you wishes to respond first. I wonder if you each might share what Louise Nevelson, her life, her work, means to you and to your own life and work. Wow. Um, all right, I'll start with that. Um, I, I will actually admit that um, in the uh, 70s, I would say, when I started to really appreciate art and, and um, I, I noticed Louise Nevelson because of the way she looked. And I, I thought she was so exotic that that was really interesting to me. And then I started to look at her art and, and began to appreciate that. But that was in the back of my mind for so long. And then to come here and to be working on this project today, it's sort of full circle on that idea. And, and it's, it's very moving to me to, to work on such an incredible project. It's a jewel. Um, and you know, we'll certainly get into that conversation further. But um, I think, you know, as a woman, as a I would say a radical woman of her day, um, as a feminist, I think that's all aspects of her that I can completely relate to. Well, I was considerably younger when I worked on my dissertation uh, in interviewing her and people who knew her, her family. And I have to say that I started out feeling envy because I had been a sculptor in the 60s in New York, but I had, and I had also taught at the same place that she taught in Great Neck and I'd gone to the same art school. But she persisted and became who we all know she became. I was sort of astonished by what seemed to me the self-involvement of this woman who kept on saying, I did this myself, I'm doing this myself, and I, I was a little bit horrified. And I later came to see that as a woman in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and even 70s, to succeed as an artist, you had to be determined. And the self-possessive uh, that she had was inspiring. I came eventually to see that this was something very few women could succeed in doing. And she knew a lot of women artists. So she started out being someone I was envious of, ended up being someone who is a real inspiration. As, as I discovered, many other women artists, uh, feminists, art world people, saw her as an enormous inspiration. And she was generous in terms of giving what she had to others supporting uh, other artists who were not so successful. So she is, uh, for me, still an inspiration. So I think I met Louise six times in the process of designing and constructing the chapel upstairs. I'll tell you a little bit later about the, no, I'll do it now. So uh, I was introduced to her by Diane Harris, who's here in the front row. Diane uh, called me out of the blue and asked if the bank, First National City Bank at the time, had an art program. And I said, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's no one there to talk to about that. Other things, but not that. And she said, um, what about the church? And I said, well, hmm, interesting. She said, so the next time I was in Cambridge, and so she said, the next time you're in New York, uh, I'll take you to lunch and show you the artists that we represent and see if there's some interest. 
So to make a long story a little bit shorter, she arranged on a Saturday morning, I think in October of 94, 74, October 74, that Ralph Peterson, the senior pastor here, and my client on this project, or this part of the project, and Barbara Murphy and I took a cab downtown to Spring Street, uh, rang the unmarked doorbell, and waited, and waited, till he rang a second time, and waited a little bit, and then the window. Uh, right over our heads, went up, and a woman leaned out over the sill and said, Who's there? <laughs> and I think it was Diane who introduced us, and she said, Oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> um, uh, let me come down. I'll be right down. So she came down the stairs and let us in, and she said, Louise isn't quite ready to receive you. Um, so she gave us the permission to wander around in the studio, which was an absolute trip. All of the work that she was busily engaged in at the moment, uh, we had access to just look at. So uh, Louise lived upstairs over the studio, and uh, so I think I may have been the first up the stairs. Um, and I introduced myself, and she was dressed in her normal regalia, multi-layered, beautifully color-coordinated uh, fabrics with her trademark mink uh, eyelashes. And she was very gracious. And when Ralph came up the stairs, he was the last, he was carrying a valise and she looked down and she said, ah, Dr. Peterson, I hope you've brought lots of money. <laughs> and we all burst into laughter, just as you did, and it broke the ice, and we immediately became best friends. Uh, Ralph enjoyed that friendship more than I was able to, because he was in residence here, and I was parachuting in. Uh, frequently. But in terms, oh, so the last time I met with her, the project had been completed for about a year. And I called her up and asked her if she'd have dinner with me. And she graciously accepted. And we went to her favorite restaurant, just right around the corner, uh, where she was obviously very well known. and seated at a table for two against a wall, and I wish I'd had a tape recorder because I cannot remember a single word of our conversation. Yet it was extraordinarily gracious, and um, she was interested in what I was doing, and et cetera, et cetera. But a warm human being, filled with soul, I'll stop it there. That relationship easily has lingered with you all these years later. How did working on this project with all these incredible people, with Louise, shape the remainder of your just remarkable career? Well, growing up and growing old is uh, <laughs> an experience in itself, right? Um, we all share share that. Um, as far as Louise's effect on my career, I never had an opportunity of working with an artist in a similar kind of way. How many of you have seen the film Crazy Rich Asians? A few. There's a big building there that I had a significant role in making happen. And uh, the, that project, we had about 15 artists that we commissioned work for. It was a five and a half billion dollar project. And I, part of my job was to make the connections with all of those architects. 
uh, none came close to the reputation, the humanity, the personality of Louise. And I was disappointed. Laura, do you want to say a word about Louise's perhaps experience with all of this? She, she had great interest in architecture, and many of her works are architectural. Uh, this must have been a really special project for her. She called herself Architect of Shadow. I'm, uh, my role tonight is channeling Louise, so I have quotes from her that I think might be helpful. And here's one. My father was a builder, and he knew materials, not only wood. I didn't want to imitate him, but I think it's in the genes. I might have rejected a lot of things about my parents, but genetic programs can't be rejected. I somehow identify very closely with architects, particularly if they're innovative. And I'm looking at you, easily. <laughs> <laughs> so architecture was really important to her. She felt, particularly in the works that she did outdoors when in, in the later part of her life, those were um, large, three-dimensional, in occupying space in the way that architecture does, but she loved working on this project. You can, you can really see the, um, her knowledge and appreciation of space with, with her sculptures, and I think that, that um, you know, the, the size of the sculptures and how they fit, whether it's interior or exterior, um, you know, if you, even if you didn't know that, you would get a sense that there's an understanding of space and perhaps even uh, architecture. Is she a guiding hand for you even now, 40 years later, and the, the work in the chapel? Well, I would say yes today. You know, if you had asked me that before um, working on this chapel now, I would probably have not considered that. But um, you know, sitting in the space, and um, you know, I've certainly spent a fair bit of time in there now to um, to appreciate it and also to consider the needs that the space, um, uh, you know, the upgrades that it needs today. But what I found amazing is that though these are, are static sculptures, um, there's tremendous movement in the work, in the room. And that's because of the skylight overhead and that vertical uh, window on the side. And as, even as, as a truck goes by, the light changes, or the time of day, or the seasons, and what have you. So it's very alive. And you know, I, I think that that, that is, is very powerful. Um, and she clearly, along with Easley, clearly had a tremendous say about that. Now, I don't know if it was, you know, perhaps Easley, you, you can speak to this, but do you think that was conscious uh, on her part or a result of? Yes, let me, in fact, speak to that because uh, Louise created two what are called maquettes, which are models uh, about three feet in length by two feet in the other direction. I think we have an image of them. We can, we can put it up for you. Um, and I built, or I had the first box that she worked in built in our office in Cambridge and brought it down with me. And she was thrilled because she really didn't understand architectural drawings, but seeing it in three dimensions made it work. To our shock, she built a second box and created two different alternatives. One, a midnight blue, and the other, of the white alternative. I fell in love with the midnight blue. <laughs> I thought it was absolutely gorgeous, and I was not reticent in telling Ralph my opinion. And he thought, for a little while and said, I like that too, but I can't imagine having a celebration of a wedding in a dark space like that. He said, I like the purity 
in the clarity of the white alternative. And Ralph and I have a different, slightly different uh, recollection of, about what I'm about to say. It has to do with the crucifix, the object behind the altar. And what's upstairs is a gold leaf crucifix, which I think is the most beautiful crucifix I've ever seen in my life. It is very abstract, of course, uh, but it has a recognizable corpus and uh, the outstretched arms. It was in the blue option. And Ralph, as I remember it, asked me if, would Louise think about switching those? And I said, well, I don't know, but I'll ask. And she was thrilled to have the responsiveness of, of both of us. So what is built upstairs is the uh, white alternative, but with the corpus from the blue, the midnight blue. And how involved was she in crafting that? Once the decision was taken to go forward with the white chapel, what was the conversation with her, her like? Did, was there a lot of back and forth? What were those conversations? Uh, so one conversation um, that I did not participate in, I don't think, was about price. Uh, what, what's it going to take to make this happen? It's been told so many times, I can't remember whether I was really there or not, but... <laughs> uh, her response was, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Um, I don't think Ralph or I ever really knew what her work might have brought. Um, she did this out of inspiration and love. The second thing that was so astonishing beyond having two options to choose from was that all the pieces are Christian iconography, reinterpreted. The 12 disciples are there, the corpus is there, and Louise's background, her heritage, was Jewish. She had not been practicing forever, uh, but she was, as Ralph would say, an extremely spiritual woman. And she really took it upon herself to make the icons specific to the Christian faith. That was really surprising. I want to uh, add again, these are Louise's words. The chapel is a holy place, a place for all people. To me, there's no distinction between a church and a synagogue. If you go deep enough into any religion, you arrive at the same point of harmony. She believed that through and through, and there were things that occurred in the course of making the chapel that started at the synagogue and then moved over here. But, but uh, one other thing about these boundaries. Abstraction allows me to transcend Christian imagery to the essential point where religions meet. Still, I'm happy that Pastor Peterson is not sectarian about the chapel. Each element forms a whole in itself, a deliberate expression of joy, of human warmth. For me, for my work, this chapel is a state of purity and truth. And I think you can hear in her words the spirituality that uh, Easley saw. Uh, certainly it was something uh, for which Diana was a big help because she understood it and supported all of these ideas and concerns that were going on while she was working on all of her sculpture. Could, could I kind of switch gears for a moment? And I think it might be helpful to put the chapel and St. Peter's into context in time of space and of 
personalities. One of my favorite lines from literature begins, sing to me, O muse, of gods and heroes. It's Homer. When I sit in this space, I'm reminded of the heroes who made this possible. <clears throat> Don Schnabel, who died about four years ago, lived a few blocks away, and in the late 60s and early 70s, he was walking by this city block and feeling that it was blighted. There was a strip joint across 54th Street uh, operational, and another one looked like it was about to be built. He came up with the idea of redeveloping it. And when he talked to Walter Riston, who was the chairman of First National City Bank, Riston thought, yeah, that would be good for the city. The bank wasn't interested in more space. They didn't want to relocate their headquarters. But he thought, as a civic responsibility, that he would look at it. So he had a senior vice president by the name of um, Henry Muller, who had once upon a time been in charge of buildings and grounds at Harvard. And he worked with my boss, Hugh Stubbins, on three projects uh, to the point where they became good friends, such good friends that when Hugh's wife, first wife, uh, kicked him out, <laughs> he moved in with Henry. <laughs> Now, I've never had a client quite as good as that. <laughs> um, but Henry called Hugh and said, I would like for you to come to the city and talk to me. And Hugh grabbed me. I was 32 and said, let's go to New York, which he did. And we walked around the block and we saw the diversity of uses. Uh, there was a legitimate theater. There was obviously what I called the toy gothic church that existed on this same spot. Uh, there were about 94 residential units that eventually had to be bought out. There was a doctor's office building in the middle of 54th Street in the middle of this block. Uh, so it was a variety of different uses. And, oh, and two bars uh, facing on Lexington Avenue one owned by the Mafia. Um, Don Schnabel eventually bought them all up for the bank. And because I was not a New Yorker, he put me on the board <laughs> of Lexmark Realty, a fake organization to buy up the property. The bank commissioned us to do a very quick study about what might be possible. And in a little more than two months, we came up with a idea that's remarkably similar to this. The form of the tower, the standing up on legs, uh, a church that was in the same location. And the bank liked the idea. They said, let's go ahead. It took two and a half years to acquire the properties. Uh, during that period of time, the bank reorganized themselves three times. And in the first reorganization, Henry Muller got pushed out, and we had no connection. <laughs> um, Cambridge, Boston-based off office. It was a scary time. But uh, we persevered. We became the architects for the church, in addition to the bank. Uh, the old biblical axiom of you can't serve Two masters is at the same time. I think we effectively disproved that. Uh, it was a successful relationship with us all. The people who were involved in this church sanctuary, uh, some are in the back wall here. The Vignellis, particularly, who were our interior designers for the project. Uh, 
they convinced us to rotate the seating by 45 degrees so that it paralleled the axis of the skylight above. Um, the shape of the, of the sanctuary itself is a cube cut on the bias uh, with the skylight down through the center that in a way reflects the slope of the top of the building. When I look up at the ceiling, uh, I'm reminded of um, Taka from my office, Tetsuo Takianagi, who designed that ceiling in conjunction with the um, acoustical engineer who was very concerned about the subways that run underneath, behind that wall, parallel to and 12 feet from the back wall of the church. So we had to isolate the uh, church from that vibration. The individual in, the, in our office, his name was Peter Whitehawk. Uh, I think there's a photograph of... I think we have, a, I think we have an image of, of you all seated around a table with one another. There you are. So if you recognize me, <laughs> the guy to my left was Peter. Peter and I were the very best of friends and his spirit is here in this space, as are so many others. All of them and many more made all of this possible. And I'm just thrilled beyond belief to be here after all these years and to reflect on the abilities of all of these people. Peter was the design guidance. He is the person who gave the physical form both to the tower and to the church. My role was just make it happen. It seems that one of the guiding principles of this whole project, or at least something that emerged out of it, was that what you were creating was an um, immensely open public space, the atrium, the outdoor plaza. Uh, it, it's interesting for those of us who have known this space predominantly only after 9-11, uh, that feeling has diminished over the years. And one of the goals of this renewal is to make certain that this space, this, the chapel is, is open for the public essentially all the time and uh, providing access as much as possible. I'm curious uh, why, what was so important perhaps then, now, for public spaces for a city, particularly a, a city like New York? So there, there are at least a half a dozen different things that come into play in thinking about that. Not the least was a study that the church did called Life at the Intersection that Ralph and the congregation pulled together as a brief, as a program that they gave to us as we approached the design of this uh, space. What the church is, was doing before we came on board was they were opening their arms to the community. Uh, they had a brown bag lunch here where aspiring actors uh, were uh, able to read and to perform pieces at lunchtime for, for the uh, people who work in the area. The famous jazz uh, outreach program that John Gensel uh, developed was already in action. Um, I will never forget sitting on the same dais at the opening and Ralph was preaching and uh, the lights came on in the city outside and people were coming up into the window and they're like that person right now and their shadows were thrown on the wall here and Ralph blended that seamlessly 
into his sermon. Life at the intersection has been a part of the reason for St. Peter's. As far as the rest of the complex is concerned, the city itself has a great deal of responsibility for it. They developed a program of incentives for plazas, for common open spaces, like in the atrium of the uh, City Corp Center project. I can take a great deal of responsibility for making those happen, including um, when I first came, went down into the subway on 53rd Street at Lex, I just was astonished and it was so awful. Just uh, the pits. <laughs> and I thought, well, if we're going to build a, a plaza, why don't we put it down at a lower level and open up the uh, access so that it can be more gracious. And we put in a fountain, which is going to be rebuilt, a slightly different design, um, with water. And the water it creates a white noise so that when you're in that space, and St. Peter's is going to be able to reuse it again for outdoor activities and good weather. All of those things create an active life of the city, and that's one of the things that the bank was so supportive of in allowing this to, to happen. The vision of Walter Riston, of Ed Palmer, and Bill Spencer, the three Board, senior board members was uh, vital to making this happen. One more anecdote. People ask me all the time about that <laughs> uh, silhouette on the skyline. How did that come to be? It came out of conversations with the city's Office of Midtown Planning and Development. Uh, they had just approved a zoning change on Fifth Avenue that allowed Olympic Towers to be built because a little bit bigger because the top of it is residences. Now, this is 1963. People were fleeing the city. Corporations were fleeing the city. Um, and they wanted to make incentives to keep people living in the city. Well, I see all these pencils going up skyward. It looks like that uh, program is still uh, working. So we, d we designed 100 condominiums at the top of the tower, uh, 50 of them facing south, terraced uh, with greenhouses because the wind's at 914 feet. Um, and it seemed like a really good idea. Um, However, when Mayor Lindsay transitioned to Mayor Wagner, the city was unable to transfer those incentives. And so the apartments went away, and the vice president who was responsible for the project said, good, they're gone, cut off the top. I said, what? <laughs> he said, cut it off. I said. We can't do that. <laughs> uh, we had to take it to Walter Riston, and he approved the design because it th he thought it, whether it had the name of, of the bank on it, it made a positive contribution to the quality of the skyline of the city, and that was important to the bank. So, Laurie, I'm wondering. You know, all of this um, history of New York, the history of this, um, this building, its role in shaping public life, uh, Nevelson must have been aware of all of that, must have, uh, I mean, she lived deeply in this city. Um, what's, do you, any sense of her commitment to the idea of not just simply art, but public art? Yes, she loved the idea. She, she believed that the more people who look at art, the more people will be deeply understanding of the human condition, of the spirituality. So she designed things for the mall in Albany. She has a plaza downtown she designed for. 
she felt it was essential to have as much public art, and it was a moment where public art was, was happening all over the country, partly because uh, steel, uh, Corten steel was making it possible, partly because it was the 70s and public art was a big thing. She was all for it and uh, felt that it was part of the contribution that she could make that went way beyond something for someone's home or something uh, for a, a, a commercial building. So yes, she was all for it, always. There's a lot of history in this space. There's a lot of cultural history, um, history of New York City, art, art history, design history. Jane, as you think about this project, because this is in a sense the first time a portion of this building has, at least in the church's uh, section of it, has been, um, uh, so some significant work is being done on it. How do you approach something like that? This is, this is, this is not just simply a space, but it's, it's all of this cultural uh, history. Well, it's, it's certainly very humbling um, and daunting. Uh, in our early um, conversations about uh, the renovation, um, and it was primarily driven by the need to, um, to condition the air in the space, in the chapel, because it's, um, it was very humid, and so the paint uh, and actually some of the wood was starting to deteriorate and pull off of her work. So, um, you know, there, there's an absolute need to address this. Um, so we approached it from that perspective, um, of course, or first, and then um, my sort of architect brain stepped in and said, well, you know, it needs to be modernized, um, you know, the lighting can be improved. I mean, it, it's, it's a very different era from the 1970s to today, and there's lots of opportunity to, to, um, to improve the, the environment of the space. So in our early conversations, we um, looked at the art and we thought, well, you know, some of it is very tight to the ceiling plane, in particular, the piece over the doors. Um, in that piece, it's touching the ceiling and it actually overhangs the door frame by about three inches. So to me, I thought, well, hmm, it doesn't quite fit. And so our first round, we thought, well, let's raise the ceiling a little bit because we had the room to do that. Give the art room to breathe. And so we sort of went down that path and we had a few conversations about it and it sort of, it made sense. And then all of a sudden, we all thought, well, wait a minute, and, and the conservators definitely had an opinion about this as well. Um, but we thought, well, Louise put her art, designed the space, the art for the experience. So if that piece hangs over the door, it was meant to hang over the door. So we scratched the idea of raising the ceiling. Um, it is where it is today and it will remain that way. And then we started to sort of look at this more as a surgery than, than a broad stroke of, of modernizing um, the space and, and making it, um, uh, giving it a future so that our, you know, the next generations can appreciate it as we have and, and as um, folks in the 70s did. Um, so now it's, it's subtle changes, they're significant, but you won't really or the goal is that you won't really notice them. Um, of course, the lighting will change and, and we'll be able to adapt to the daylight and, and the change in, in daylight. Um, the air will certainly be improved. The, the one move that we are changing that um, you know, will be noticeable, though I don't think um, <clears throat> that Louise may have considered it, but today the air is brought into the space right over the um, panels on the east side. And so that, you know, dumping the cold air, <clears throat> excuse me, over the art is, is a problem over time. So we're moving that. Um, but other than that, uh, there really aren't any large moves that we're making. Um, but easily, I do have a question for you. Um, there's been uh, I've seen some of the drawings, I've 
seen some photographs, I've heard conversations um, about the uh, vertical window, the full height window on the north side. Um, it's clear glass today. Was that originally um, a frosted glass or was it intended to be? I know at one point there was frosting on that. Do you, um, can you tell us the story of that? So the original design had a window there and that window was shown in the uh, wooden model that I built or had built for Louise to work on. And uh, she did not want a window there. She asked me, can't we close that? And I said, well, it would be difficult. We've gotten approval of the entire building and to do that at this stage would be awkward at least. And uh, I said, why do you want it closed? She said, I, it, it, this needs to be a space of contemplation. I don't want to see things moving by in the street or people looking in that window. And I said, well, what about frosting it? And she said, that would be fabulous. So we put a plastic scrim over that window. Uh, which she was very pleased with. She is used, was used to working in a, um, a museum environment where her pieces would be put wherever it was convenient to locate them. So for her to be able to control the entire environment was really important to her. And that window was one of the things that she felt particularly strongly about. I understand that uh, Arnie Glimsher, the owner of the Pace Gallery, uh, who was not party to those discussions, uh, assumed that the window had always been uh, uh, clear glass and that that's what she wanted. That's not the, that's not the way things happened. I wanted to add a, a statement again that confirms that by Louise. I've tried to take the chapel out of the formal and the ceremonial and bring it back to the inner being. It's a house where people can feel calm. They can meditate or hear a sermon. It's also a place to go in despair and find quiet, a warm, beautiful place of purity where people can solve what bothers them. So you can see why she wouldn't have wanted people looking in a window. And so, so if I can add another uh, dimension to this discussion, it's the relationship between Ralph Peterson and Louise. They became enormously good friends, um, a relationship that was precious, I think, to both of them. I was talking with Ralph, uh, a week or so ago, hour and a half conversation, we stay in close touch. And we were talking about the difference between the chapel and the sanctuary. And he said, uh, the chapel is the heart of St. Peter's. And I said, Ralph, I don't disagree with you often, but it seems to me the heart of the church is here in the sanctuary. It's the soul of the church that resides in the chapel. I think Louise would like that. Perhaps even the soul for the city, too. Uh, one final question for each of you, and there's no particular order, but I'm just wondering, particularly as all of these people have uh, come and they are getting connected and are committed to this campaign to renew the chapel, I'm wondering, um, why does this renewal of Nevelson Chapel matter to each of you? She was an extraordinary artist, and the gift that she gave by designing this chapel was a gift to everybody who could come in at 24-7 and find something for themselves there. That it is going to be available the way she originally planned it 
was very important to her. She did not think it should just go with time and have things chip off. She felt renewal was, was really important and bringing things back to life was really important. And I, I mentioned last night that she felt she took pieces of wood that someone else had worked on and by putting them in the sculpture, she brought it to new life and was giving that to the people who would see it and experience uh, what she was trying to create with her sculpture. Just to pick up on those, those same themes, I remember conversations with Louise where she was thinking about this chapel as a unique commission. Most of her pieces were done for residences where she had no control over or museum installations where she might have had control for three months and then the pieces would be disassembled and sold to whoever wanted to buy them. This was to be different. This was a gift to the church, to the city, and she would say to the universe, because those were the words that she felt comfortable in using, a very spiritual person. It certainly is a gift um, to the city and I think it's our duty to um, bring that to the next generations um, to appreciate it. And uh, 1977 to whenever, um, I think people will still experience it in, um, you know, in, in, in ways that we need. I mean, in the city, it's a chaotic city. It was a chaotic city then, it's a chaotic city today. Uh, it will be in the future, unfortunately. Um, and so it's our duty to, to maintain these you know, jewels in the city, and there aren't very many. Um, you know, the, 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 not everybody can afford to go to a museum or um, you know, to appreciate an interior installation like this. Um, you know, there's, there's great art in, in homes and there's great art in museums, but this is great art that's available to everybody. And I think that is, as a mission and, and your passion for it is tremendous. And, and you know, I'm certainly delighted to, to play a tiny role in that uh, future. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Easley. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for your passion for sharing from your heart, from your soul. Thank you for your commitment to Nevelson and this masterwork and to this place. And thank you, all of you, for your participation in this renewal campaign. Um, it's tremendous. As, as we conclude this evening, I, I'm pleased to make a, a special announcement, and that is that over the course of this past summer, some of you may know this, but for some others it may be brand new, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities Sustaining Cultural Heritage Program awarded Nevelson Chapel a $350,000 grant to support this sustainable environmental upgrade that Jane and we've been speaking about tonight that ensures the long-term conservation uh, of Nevelson Chapel, which means that to date we've raised $1.1 million for this $5.75 million campaign. That's a major step forward. Uh, this isn't in my script, but I, 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 I know these numbers well. The, the NEH awarded $2.2 million in that category to just 12, um, 12 projects, and we received the largest grant. So that's uh, a testament to this initiative. Additionally, we have received and we hope to receive in the next few months several significant gifts from foundations and from leadership givers, and we will announce those gifts soon. If you're interested in becoming a leadership donor, please speak to any member of the Nevelson Legacy Council, and I'll ask them in a moment to stand so you know who they are. Indeed, everyone's gifts are critical to this campaign. Uh, please connect with the campaign at nevelsonchapel.org. Uh, where there you can make a pledge, you can give a gift, you can follow the, the progress. 
Um, follow us especially on Instagram and on Facebook. Our handle is Nevelson underscore Chapel, and our hashtag is Nevelson Chapel Renewed. Uh, before we adjourn to the living room for reception, or reception, allow me to introduce some people in addition to Lori Jane and Easley you may wish to continue uh, the conversation with when you get out there. Maria Nevelson, Louise's uh, granddaughter, is with us this evening. Maria, thank you. So good to have you with us. Wearing your grandmother's pin, that's beautiful. Um, uh, there's some members and friends of St. Peter's. My senior colleague, Amanda Durr, is sitting in the, the back row there. Do you know who that is? And uh, Maria Del Toro, who is the chair of St. Peter's Internal Planning Committee for the chapel. Maria is a former commissioner of the city of New York and vice president of the YMCA and brings a lot of passion and experience uh, to this, and we're so grateful for that leadership. Our art conservator, Sarah Numberg, and her team, Soraya, Sarah, and Laurel. Sarah, where are you? There, Sarah. And there are a number of members of the Nevelson Legacy Council with us e this evening. If you're a member of that, would you stand so people know who you are? There's Donald. Oh, we've got a fantastic. And uh, Deborah Inwald, Christine Waba, and Marissa Grant from Works in Progress, our progress man project managers are here. Stand up so people see you. They will be uh, pleased to receive you up in the chapel to talk about the HVAC and the other environmental upgrades that are ab about to begin uh, there. Um, you also may be interested to know that Nevelson Chapel will be open all day for Open House New York on Saturday, October 13th, and architectural historian and author, author Judith Dupre will offer a lecture at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Come back for that. Um, that'll be the last time the, pudge, the, the um, chapel will be open for the public before uh, the work is protected in place, and we close the space and begin that uh, four month, five month <laughs> environmental upgrade. One ever really wants to speak those words aloud in, in New York City, <laughs> particularly to Jane. Uh, and then this final announcement, a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, Pace Gallery's uh, Arnie Glimpshire very much wants to be part of our next salon and uh, I see a few people from Pace here. Diane is here and Joyce is here, uh, sitting right next to one another. And uh, we also hope to have a very special guest with a uh, long and distinguished career in government here that night. You stay tuned to figure out who she is. And uh, on that bit of a cliffhanger, just join us now in the living room and the chapel for refreshments, conversation. Thank you all. Thank Jared, you, and Jared, good night. Jared, oh, if, there's Easley. If, he gets the last word. If, if, if I may, before you uh, scatter, thank you, Jared. We wouldn't be here tonight without your help and encouragement. Thank you. And, And what, I've, and what I've learned in art preservation in these last several days has been an education. So thank you. Thank you, Easley. Thank you. Join us uh, for a reception now. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>